Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. In honor of Veterans Day, this week's episode is about 84 Charlie Mopic, the 1989 feature film about small unit operations during the Vietnam War, where a combat cameraman provides our point of view. I'm excited to welcome a star-studded panel of guests. First, writer-director Patrick Duncan. Pat, welcome to Below the Line. Thank you. Next, cinematographer Alan Queso. Alan, great to have you here. Uh, thanks, kid. And finally, rounding out our film guest is producer Michael Nolan. Michael, glad you could join us. Thank you. As regular listeners may be aware, before I worked as an assistant director, I was an Air Force combat camera officer. And so as co-host for this episode, I've invited two former colleagues from my Vandenberg Air Force days. First, returning to the podcast is Jim Staten, who served as a career Air Force photographer from 1973 until 1996 and retired at the rank of Master Sergeant. Welcome back, Jim. Thank you. And making his below the line debut, Al Gurloff served as a combat videographer from 1982 until 2007 and also retired at the rank of Master Sergeant. Nice to see you, Al. Thank you for having me. Now, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while and I'm anxious to get into it. But first, a warning to listeners today's conversation will contain spoilers for the film. You should go watch it. Last I checked, you could stream it for free on Amazon Prime, Hulu, and a couple of other streamers. To start us off and set some context, Pat, talk to me about the name of this film and explain to our listeners what 84 Charlie Mopec is supposed to indicate. In the Army, like in the Air Force, you have a job designation. I was an 11 Foxtrot. That's an infantryman reconnaissance. And 11 Bravo is a ground pounder. And uh, 84 Charlie Mopec is the designation for a combat cameraman. What is the designation on the Air Force? AFSC 252X3. AFSC was the Air Force Specialty Code, and I was a 23571, I believe. Or I might have made it up. I'm not sure. <laughs> 232. Long you were 232X1. <laughs> okay. I think or X2. No, you were X2. That was still photo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tell me about taking this approach and sort of the conceit of the film, what you wanted to achieve by focusing on the 84 Charlie Mopic? Well, um, I wanted to write a Vietnam piece and uh, I was stuck to find a way to, I, I don't like the ones where it's raw, raw, I'm a hero or uh, the kind of films where killing people seems to be heroic. And I wanted to make an intimate Vietnam film and I didn't know how to do it. And then one day I was watching the news in Los Angeles and uh, there had been a horrible traffic accident and there was a woman sitting on the curb. Uh, I think she just lost her husband. She had blood on her face and the cameraman had gone on up there and stuck the camera in her face and said, uh, what are you feeling right now? Which was rude and uh, disconcerting, and so intimate that I felt so sorry for her. And I thought, oh, that's the way to do it. Uh, let's put a camera in there, because I'd seen a few in Vietnam. And then it became important that I do a sustained take, that the camera didn't cut away. No editing, because uh, editing, the first time you see an edit, you know somebody's manipulating you. And it takes away some of the intimacy also. So I decided to do it in sustained takes, which became a problem. <laughs> well, we only cheated once. This yeah. is the Michael Nolan speaking. We, there's only actually one place where there's an internal cut. All the rest are just extended takes. Yeah. And uh, so we sent it around. I could have sold it a few times. Nick Rogue wanted to buy it at one point. Uh, a great cameraman, just remarkable uh, director too. And uh, a few other people wanted to buy it, but I wanted to direct it because I knew that they would turn it into something, a regular film. And uh, I went to Sundance with the Director's Fellowship there, or whatever it's called, the Director's Lab. 
and I had five or six famous DPs, directors of photography, tell me that it was impossible to do this. <laughs> uh, I'm really they were, great. They were they were older DPs, uh, clearly, right? <laughs> no, not really. No. Is that right? <laughs> Some oh of gosh. them were younger than me. Wow. Um, I was younger than you too, I think. Yeah. No, no longer though. <laughs> Even David Putnam, who was running Columbia Pictures at the time, said this is impossible to do. But he was good enough to give us ten thousand dollars to do a proof of concept, which we shot in Griffith Park. Yeah. I told I told Michael we should have shot the whole movie. <laughs> Could have shot the whole movie for a hundred thousand. He's right. He's absolutely yeah. right about that. And it was a hundred thousand, wasn't it, Michael? It was a hundred thousand. Yeah, it was a hundred thousand. Yeah. So the proof of concept cost a hundred thousand dollars. Check. Yeah, and uh, we shot in the back lot, and um, you know, just trying it out. Uh, but anyways, the cinematographers kept on telling, talking me out of it. And one cinematographer who worked for Scorsese a lot, Michael, oh, what was his name? Michael Chapman? Michael Chapman? Yes. Michael Chapman uh, said, no, he took me to lunch to try and talk me me out of it. And um, when we finished the film, I saw Michael Chapman at some function, and he came up to me and he said, you were right. And that was so (laughs) nice. That was it big. Was, yeah, it was it was yeah, incredible. But nobody wanted to do it that way. Yeah. And various contracts came along that they said they'd do it that way and then there'd be a musical soundtrack <laughs> of pop songs. Yeah. That's when I gave them Pat's home telephone number because they thought there's no f- first time director that's ever going to turn down an opportunity to make his first film. Yeah. And I I refused. And then we had uh, one that wanted the, me to cast all the sons of famous stars, Steve McQueen's son and Chuck Norris's son and people like that. And I refused that too. It was important that you not recognize any of these people, that they seemed real. But we had, we had a, a long trek ahead of us. I wrote the script in a week, by the way. It took me five years to get the money. Yeah. Had the three of you then come together through the um, Sundance Lab? Or, Alan, when did you actually get involved? Michael, were you already there? And when did the three of you become like the core of this film? I was a stray dog that they picked up off the street, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I interviewed a lot of DPs. And uh, they'd start talking about laying track uh, <laughs> and, and or, uh, you know, getting a crane. <laughs> and so on. Uh, nobody wanted to shoot it handheld. Except me. <laughs> yeah. You're the best handheld cameraman in the world, so. Yeah. If you, if you take a look at uh, TV afterwards, a lot of shows became handheld. Yes. Uh, That's a- right. After Mo Pick. That's true. I mean, I, I, had, I had, at that point, uh, 12 years of doing Steadicam. So I came from a, a moving camera kind of language yeah and when we start getting information i just want to go back on something that patrick had brought up earlier which was very very crucial and in center for this whole idea of how we shot this is the fact that these were sustained takes sustained handheld takes and what that really did is it it made everything in real time so you know just as patrick said you know you start cutting the audience knows they're manipulated. And don't get me wrong. Audiences expect to be manipulated when they, they go to the movies. They they want to be manipulated because they want to go for the roller coaster ride. But that's not really what this film was about. This film was wanting to bring you there in real time and real space. And so by having these sustained sustained takes, it made it very immersive to the audience. It made them feel like they were right there. Plus, we shot it with a lot of wide lenses. Except I I do these zooms every so often. Because, you know, the cameras back then, they did have zooms. You had to zoom in, especially if you're doing um, you know, any kind of documentary work. Uh, but most of the time, I was on a wide lens, and you felt like you were putting the audience right in the room. And that was the whole concept of this, is to put that audience right in the room, make it real time. Yeah. yeah. Get as close to the person as possible, 
and make you feel for them. You know, it's it just like uh, when you watch the news. <laughs> right. It's really funny because these guys hired me. This is my first job as a DP. So and it's really funny because years later, I came to teach at uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, and Mike Nolan was teaching there. And so the, the students always get a big kick when I tell them, hey, you know, I, I, Professor Nolan, he's the guy who hired me for my first job. <laughs> but he's really the two of you, Michael and Patrick. Yeah. I got to know Alan much better here in Savannah years later than I did because he was actually hired to replace a cameraman that wanted to direct the movie. And um, oh, is that what that was about? <laughs> that's that's what that was about. And uh, and I mean, he was fantastic. But I, as you can well imagine, this is not the kind of set that you can have lots and lots of spectators because they're shooting in every direction and you don't know exactly where where they're going. So I've actually got to know Alan much better years later yeah. than I did during the shooting of Mopec. I, I looked at a lot of uh, DPs, some who became very famous. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I turned them down uh, and I looked at documentary uh, cameramen, but uh, they didn't quite get it either. Uh, Alan got it and he was enthusiastic and I knew it was going to be a really tough shoot because I'd spent some time at Sundance doing the same thing and I was wearing out a cameraman every day. <laughs> uh, at Sundance, I got a lot of flack uh, all the time. And there's nothing better for a director, I think, than having to fight for your vision. Yeah. It really helps you refine it. But it also helps you question what you're trying to do. And when you affirm yourself, yeah. then you know you're on the right track. But you find out what, what you're really trying to do. Right. And uh, I, I got static for uh, the first day of shooting. They give you – I had – Aiden Quinn, I think, and um, uh, Richard Brooks, two actors. The I, first day of shooting at Sundance. Like, yeah. This is like five years before we actually made the movie. Yeah, the fir first day at Sundance, uh, they give you some actors from uh, BYU, these Mormon kids. I didn't know who they were, if they could act or anything, and I needed to form a team immediately. So I had all the actors play a volleyball game against the crew. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it became, you know, they were young men, and so it became pretty vociferous and uh, a little violent. And, uh, uh, and, and then I got them on set, and I had a team. Right. And uh, I got a lot of static from um, the acting people at Sundance and a couple of others, instead of rehearsing, I went and played volleyball. <laughs> and Redford came into the room and stood up for me. He said, leave the kid alone. He knows what he's doing. And after that, it was a little easier. The first time, it, it was amazing. Uh, Sundance is just so, uh, such a great place. The first time I heard the script read was in a little room where they rented skis. And I had Sam Waterston, Richard Brooks, Aidan Quinn, Morgan Freeman. Oh, my God. That's and uh, Hume Cronin. Oh, my God. And I'm sitting in the front wall just watching and making notes, right? And when we started, there was like four people there. And when we finished, I turned around and the room was packed, standing room only. And people were crying. Very good. And uh, I knew I had something. I just had to, you know, keep on editing, which was a process through the whole thing. But One of the interesting things about Sundance was that Pat got to make this movie with all females one day. Yep, I did that on purpose. I asked for female actresses and, and shot it with females for a day. Great. I learned a lot there, too. Yeah. Uh, um, the females or um, more uh, into physical comfort and communication. And I remember when I was a squad leader that I used to go up to all my men and I was always putting my hand on their shoulder uh, or, you know, and touching them. 
because you can tell a lot about a guy if he's getting too stressed or if he's down or anything just by putting a hand on them and feeling their heartbeat. And so uh, I, I brought that into the next rehearsal and onto the set. Yeah. If you notice, the guys are touching each other a lot. Yeah, that's true. Especially Richard, the leader, is, is doing that. Right. One of the things I also want to say about that was a bonus when Alan came on this movie was that our original concept was to shoot this one three three like an old documentary format and stuff like that. And the distributor that finally was the last piece in terms of getting the money said, Michael, you can't do that. This movie's got to be a little bit widescreen. And because Alan was really an expert in terms of, in terms of that stuff, I mean, from a producing point of view, that was his major contribution to this was because it really allowed me to, um, settled the distributor down yeah yeah and we shot in uh super 16 which is a right. great format which is really important for this the look of this it had just the might the right amount of grain but still it was very yeah. cinematic i mean it had a very yeah. big screen look to and it. and the magazines were a lot lighter <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i you know what i i reviewed the film over the weekend and when i finished watching the movie i said oh my god i am exhausted <laughs> I got exhausted watching my work. It was like, how could I have ever done that? No way I could have done that even 20 years ago. You were young. <laughs> oh, I was a lot younger. Absolutely. But that just, it was exhausting, you know. And I was brutal. I was very much a director in that I would uh, be alongside Alan as he was shooting. I didn't use a monitor or anything. I remember. And I would just stand there and look over his shoulder and so on. And when we were doing movement, I would hit him with my hip. Yeah. Because he's a little too smooth in the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And, and one time I tripped him. Yeah. Uh, my, my philosophy And that's was, my favorite part of the Oh, yeah. No, that's film. great. That was Because he falls and he keeps the guys in frame. Right. Bam. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that, that was important. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, it was... It's really interesting because, um, you know, I tried to keep it as smooth as possible because just the natural body motion is enough movement. Um, but Patrick would definitely add a few more bumps and grinds. <laughs> so, and it worked. It worked fine. It made made it very human. Made it very realistic. I had to, used to have to warn people in big theaters not to sit in the front rows. <laughs> yeah, because they'd get nauseous. Yeah. Now, when you were filming like that, did you also have Byron Tim's? who's playing the Mopic character, was he there as well? I know there's sometimes you're filming and there's dialogue. How did that work on set? That's really interesting that you asked that. Be because I love the fact that they hired me for this film. And then when I found out that I had to basically play the eighth character, I completely freaked out. I started sweating. He said, you know, I'm not an actor. I can't do this. And I actually had to memorize lines, right? They, 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 had, they had an actor who was contracted with SAG, and he was, he was the one who ended up being visually in front. And at one point, Patrick, didn't you say you even wanted to keep my voice? I loved his voice. <laughs> and, so, and unfortunately, SAG said, no way. You know, yeah. you gotta... and, then, and then there was the problem of trying to dub uh, Byron. Yeah, right. But I loved Alan's voice. Maybe I had gotten used to it. I don't know. Uh, I think that's what you told me. You, yeah. you said you had gotten used to it, yeah. Well, it, it, it became this weird partnership because even though it doesn't look it, every camera move is rehearsed. Absolutely rehearsed, yeah. Right. When to zoom in, when to pull out, when to make it a two shot, when to... I storyboarded the film. Yep. And so you had to think, okay, there's no editing here, but if I was editing, I'd go for a close up here and then a wide shot here and so on. And we did that with inside the camera. With inside the, mo inside the shot. Yeah, it was really important for us. We did rehearse every shot that we did and quite a bit for a couple of reasons. First of all, we wanted to know what our shot was, but also we're, we're shooting film and you, know, and, and you can't be shooting endless amounts of film because it's expensive. Um, but we rehearsed all that stuff and then the trick was to make it look like it was the first take every time. Yeah, and that was hard on the actors. It was. Some of the actors had been with me on various tests and so on 
for a few years. Yeah. Uh, and they were pretty locked into their roles. I knew them pretty well, but they knew them too well. And so I'd have to go to them and give them some last minute changes and upset their root there. Which was good. Yeah. And uh, I remember we were doing, um, I think it was Nick's uh, Easy's little monologue. Mm -hmm. And it was so mechanical. He'd just done it too many times. He'd, he'd worked hard the night before. He had it down too good. Right. And there's a lot of cursing in the film. And so I said, okay, uh, I want to do a coverage for PBS or something, uh, you know, for television. <laughs> I want to do television coverage so you can't cuss. So <laughs> give me the monologue like you were telling it to your mother. And that upset him enough that it came off perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We ultimately did sell it to PBS. Yes, we did. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's great. Well, the helicopter, on the last day, the helicopter didn't get off the ground. Oh, God, remember that? Oh, my God. And, and, well, I don't think that was the last day, though, was it? That was in the middle yeah, of the shoot. The, the last two days. Last two days. I didn't yeah. know, I remember. And we'd flown this helicopter in from, like, Vegas or something. That was the only place where we could find a Huey. Right. It landed, and then it wouldn't get up. This is a great story. They're, so we had a Teamster on set because we had to, unions. He didn't do anything because we didn't move anywhere. We all shot within a quarter of a mile of where we had our camp. Yeah, that's right. And so while we were there, I watched him take his engine out of his vehicle and clean it and put it back together and put it in. Now, we flew in some mechanics to fix the helicopter, and they spent half a day doing it, and they couldn't get it done. And then the guy came up, this young man, uh, Teamster, and he says, can I have a whack at it? <laughs> and I said, what the hell? Why not? And we sent him over there, and he fixed it. <laughs> That's after. And we got a half a day of shooting, actually, because of that. And, and to reward him, I gave him a ride in the helicopter. He'd never been in one before. Oh, That's great. <laughs> but anyways, didn't so know that story. we had the, the helicopter. Well, Michael was gone because he we went to a meeting. <laughs> remember, Michael? I don't remember what meeting it was, but yeah, it's true. it was an AA meeting. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Michael was so upset he went to an AA meeting, and <laughs> I took the time and I went out, and we shot coverage of all the big scenes without the dirty words. Uh, that's why how we got a PBS version American Playhouse and we're out there trying to think of okay uh, what's a substitute for motherfucker uh, oh mother trucker and and every every bad word you can think of it it became a little hysterical because the guys are trying to think of <laughs> words that would get uh, a TV coverage but we shot TV coverage and we had it it was maybe mainly audio now, both Pat and Alan, you had background in television at the time, and specifically Vietnam. Alan, you were shooting on Tour of Duty, a show I actually remember growing up. And Pat, yeah. you were uh, writing and uh, producing over on Vietnam War Story for HBO. How did that tie in? And then as far as this work, and then Michael, some about how you managed to produce this film. How much did it cost? The movie ultimately cost about $800,000, but we made the proof of concept for $100,000. And Pat said after we did that, that, you know what, if the, if we had thought to ourselves, we could have made the whole movie for $100,000, but. Yeah. So we'll talk to me about those early days and how, again, how this came together and, and where you were filming such things. I'll start with uh, the Pat's agent gave me the script and um, I think I mentioned to you in the sort of preliminary that um, I was a very active Vietnam War protester. And um, once I read his script, I realized that, I, I mean, I wasn't pro-war, but I realized that that I had been so naive in terms of what the soldier's experience was and stuff like that. And so it became um, a real passion project for me. And... Um, 
I had been fortunate enough that I had been invited to the second think tank for Sundance and stuff like that. So I knew this was, was, was coming up and I really, really lobbied for them to take Patrick. And I think Michelle Satter was um, the person that um, championed this. And, and Frank Pearson. Oh, Frank Pearson. That's right. And um, I thought that having gone to Sundance, it would be like the good housekeeping seal of approval and I would get the money right away, you know, and that wasn't the case. And there was a certain point of like four years into this, I said, Patrick, I haven't raised the money for you. Why did you stay with me? And he said, because Michael, you were the only one that wanted to make the same movie as me. Right. That's important. Yeah. Um, that's absolutely, everybody had to be on the same page for this, uni the uniqueness of, of the language of this film. Yeah. I mean, uh, for myself, I, all during the eighties, I was, I, I was a camera operator still professionally. That's what I did for, you know, 12 years. And, uh, you know, I was, I was still, I was an operator on tour duty. I wasn't the DP and we had just come back from Hawaii. They were going to do the next two seasons in Los Angeles. And, uh, yeah, that was a different show. It was completely a different. Uh, everything about it was different and wrong for what the language was of this. But the one thing that we did do on tour duty, that at least that first season, was that all that was handheld as well. So, so that was the only probably similar language. Although there were a lot of cutting, and you know, it wasn't the lang The actual film language was different. Patrick, who recommended Alan to you? Because uh, was that Julie that yes. brought him on? Julie. No, no. Uh, uh, Jill. Was it? It was John Wells. Oh, that would make sense. John Wells. I had some connection with him at something. John Wells. Uh, I I got to know at the Writers Guild, and he was very uh, encouraging to me. You know, the sticking to my guns and so on. Hmm. And uh, I think John recommended Alan, and uh, then I asked around, and Julie had knew some of his work, and. Uh, uh, who else? One other person I can't remember. But it's interesting because they 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 knew my work as an operator, not as a DP, because I hadn't DP'd anything. Yeah, you but guys were the first as a handheld operator. I guess so. Well, steady cam for a, sure. You had a really good reputation as that. So okay. And, well, the, the steady cam in, intrigued me, but I didn't want to use steady. No, that wouldn't have been right for this. No. But but that's handheld, and I wanted somebody. Uh, there's there was a line of you know hollywood tracks you know steady cam all of that and then documentary footage rough and ugly right and i wanted to find a place in the middle right and i thought alan would steady cam uh history would counter my tendency to go the other way yeah you have to, as a director, know your own weaknesses in a some some way. Yeah, the, and where the you proof can... of concept that we had that the actor, I mean, the the cameraman for that, who we would have probably done the movie with, except that he was doing Pee Wee's Playhouse, uh, but he didn't, he, and he didn't want to take the cut and pay. But we met. He <laughs> was that he, Peter. Was that Peter? Peter? Um, Peter? No, it wasn't him. Anyway. And the proof of concept, the actor falls, I mean, the cameraman falls down sometimes and stuff like that because he's playing. And I probably, I don't know that, I mean, that would not have played in theaters and stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't part of the decision to hire Alan, um, but it was the best decision that I never made. The interesting thing was that at Sundance, every day we would shoot. We would shoot a day and then a day of an analysis, shoot a day, a day of analysis, back and forth. And then we had that proof of concept thing. Peter Smokler, you're, you're right. It was Peter Smokler. Peter Smokler. That's what I thought, yeah. And uh, I learned how far you could push it until it was just irritating. I did that on purpose uh, at, to where it was too smooth because one day I had him set up track. Right. I remember that. It's boring as hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it didn't work. But I, I had, I tested both sides of the spectrum on the camera work. And then uh, uh, Alan, on the first, we rehearsed for a week. I remember that. We had a week of of rehearsal 
with with the camera, with the camera and the with the camera, and the full cast. I remember that because we had to figure out. <laughs> this is the the weird part of Mopic is nobody ever asks where the sound is coming from. <laughs> right. They, I guess, they're used to sound on film. I don't know. We kind of assume that that the, the microphone was attached to the camera or something, or that, something. Yeah. You know, we yeah. just we never addressed it, and we got away with it. We did. Uh, that was one of my worries at Sundance, and I had to test. But anyways, I mean, I so, think that David Putnam would have given us some money if he hadn't gotten fired. Yeah, that was the guy who hired us for the t uh, test of the concept. But anyways. So we had a full crew. We had makeup. We had uh, uh, props. We had uh, sound. We had a boom mic and a sound recorder. And that's a lot of people behind the camera. Yeah. So we had to figure out how do you run through the jungle or the woods without all these people getting in the way. <laughs> And that first week of rehearsal, it some people great. bumped into each other. <laughs> sure did. I mean, we had full-on crashes. <laughs> yeah, but we learned what we could do. And our sound guy, I have to give him props. Michael Moore. Michael Moore. He was an old guy then. He used to be a jazz guitar player. <laughs> so we, we bonded immediately. I love music. and But anyways, he would put that recorder around his neck and run in the woods with us. Oh, I remember that now. Oh, boy, that's right. And he would boom himself if he had to. I mean, he, he just did it all. And he asked for this microphone before shooting. It was a special microphone made in Germany. And it was expensive as hell. And Michael saw that and went nuts. And I went nuts. Why are we going to spend this on a fucking microphone? <laughs> and Michael Moore said, I've been to the location. There's a lot of trucks going up and down that road that's only a quarter of a mile from you. And where is this? Where did you film it? New Hall. Yeah, we filmed it in the shadow of Magic Mountain, actually. Yeah, just north of Magic Mountain. It's in a shot, I think. Just a hair of it in the final shot. I can see it every time. God damn it. <laughs> but anyways... <laughs> We're close to this road, and there was all, all of these agriculture trucks going up and down the hill, shifting gears. Right. And Michael said, I assure you, with this microphone, I can cancel most of that out. I said, oh, yeah, my fucking dialogue. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> that's all we got in the film. It's just people talking. All I got is dialogue. So we bought him the microphone, and I think we gave it to him at the end of the shoot because he was able to literally, through some magical electronic fairy dust, yeah, he was amazing. make all of my dialogue clear. It's an amazingly directional microphone is what it was. Yeah, and he was allowed to yell cut. I gave Michael Moore, the sound guy, permission to yell cut, because if the sound wasn't good, there was no point in doing the scene. And he did it about three or four times. Yeah. He was great. How many days of filming did you guys have on we this? Shot three weeks, I think. Three weeks, yeah. Wow, that's it. Six day weeks, so I think it was eight, eight. Yeah, so eighteen days. Yeah. Yeah. And and we, we used to go after a long day of shooting, then we'd go over about five miles away to a screening room and we'd look at the dailies from the previous day. Remember that? It was a long day for us. Yeah. A long day. I room with the tech advisor. And New Hall. <laughs> and he and I would go to Vaughn's and get something for dinner. And we'd get the National Enquirer. And we were so fucking tired that we'd be giddy with laughter as we read the Enquirer at night. <laughs> and then we'd go to bed. Tell me more about your technical advisor, Russ Thurman, and his role on set. Russ was indispensable. The first week of, um, of rehearsal, Basically, Russ put these actors through basic training. Yep. And they would be, uh, they, in the morning they do basic training, in the afternoon we would rehearse. And uh, the first day we sat down with the scripts, they're in their uh, fatigues uh, and they've got their weapons and everything. 
And about 35 minutes into the rehearsal, I had them ambushed. I didn't know that. I didn't remember that. I remember the actors telling me about that. Yeah, they were really upset. I said, all bets are off. This is what Vietnam was like. You didn't know. You could be sitting there having a Coke and somebody's shooting at you. You could be out in the field just walking along and somebody's shooting at you. Remember this moment. When you go in the field, your radar is out every second. There's somebody trying to kill you out there. And they took it to heart, pretty much. They were very good ab about doing the training and everything. Yeah, they loved it. It was like yeah, it was like true boot camp, and they they embraced it wholeheartedly. I found Russ Thurman uh, doing Vietnam War stories for HBO, which was a half hour anthology series about Vietnam. The first year, we had two producers that didn't follow into the second and third year. But the two producers hired Russ because he was a Marine and I'd been Army. And they thought that we would be antagonistic toward each other because <laughs> they were trying to tamp down my influence. I think uh, <laughs> being a vet, I wanted everything to be so accurate that nobody could complain. And, and that costs money. But anyways, so Russ and I met, and we're both Vietnam vets, and we just bonded instantly. You guys know how it works. You're just, you know, part of the brotherhood, right? And so it was us two against them. <laughs> so it worked against them. So they, they all blew up in their faces. <laughs> yeah. And Russ and I, you know, we were having uh, trouble on the set. We are two days behind on a five-day shoot, and everything was falling apart. And Russ and I were sitting in a in chairs telling dirty jokes, and somebody from HBO came by and said, "How can you guys be laughing?" And Russ and I both said about the same time, "Hey, as long as nobody's shooting at, at us, we're okay." <laughs> <laughs> but I, I brought Russ along to to Mopic, and he was invaluable because yeah. every time the guys started to fall out of character. Russ would take him aside. And it was tough on us. Um, every time we killed a character, Russ and I would go off in the woods and, and we would cry for a little while. Um, it, it, it brought up a lot of stuff that we didn't want to. But uh, he, he was my uh, partner through the whole thing. Good guy. This film kind of helped a lot of vets through stuff, didn't it, when they watched it? Yeah, we used to do uh, screenings all the time for veterans groups out in West L.A. at the Veterans Administration right. and other places. I've done them in Utah. I've done them in Reno. I've done them in San Diego and so on. Uh, part of the problem with vets who have a problem is they don't talk about it. Hmm. And this movie um, causes conversation so it helped them talk about it yeah i lived for a summer with a guy a vietnam vet who had lost his arm he would never talk to me about his experience never yeah which is why the script had such an impact on me i do think that writing is a way to cope uh, not just for myself uh, part of when i'd go to vet organizations and talk to the guys I'd say, uh, you know, write me a story about your worst day or write me a story about your best day. Just write it down and then we can talk about it or not. But writing it down it itself seems to help a bit. Hmm. Well, you start getting objective and everything, you know. Yeah. And also, it's probably a way that when they write it out, they realize it's not quite the big monster that they've been thinking it was, or can at least confront that monster. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and, and sometimes I'd, uh, I'd get their stories and I'd ask them to write it again from the first person. Oh, interesting. Uh, that, it, it's better to do third person the first time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. But anyways, uh, yeah, it, it helps some guys, I think. Uh, well, I hope so. 
Uh, the, the great thing about when we went to Sundance with the film was that um, some kid came up to me. He was like 17 or something. And he said, uh, I have a question. <laughs> and I said, yeah, what is it? He says, some of the guys die without any last words. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. And uh, he'd been taught with films that, you know, guys lay there, bullet in their chest or something, and they have a little monologue. <laughs> right. And, you know, I said, no, a lot of the guys, they just go. I said, interesting. I, I was thinking of enlisting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I said, well, think again. <laughs> think again. <laughs> That, the location where we shot, there were also some real natural dangers. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember the rattlesnake? I was just going to bring that up. There's this huge wood pile, massive wood pile. We don't know. <laughs> it must have been some major cleanup that they had done 15 years ago, right? And it was like the ogre or the, or the troll under the bridge. You never really saw it, but you heard it. You'd, you'd walk by every day. Well, the first thing was... I was going to shoot it with, use it in the background. Right. And I put the guys all in front of it, you know, and start the rehearsal, and we hear this. Right. <laughs> and, and everybody kind of jumps away from this mound, and Russ and I go look, and there is the biggest rattlesnake I ever saw in my life. <laughs> Massive. It had to have been six feet long yeah. if, it was a, if it was a foot. And that was there for quite a long time. Yeah, every day we'd walk by it. <laughs> but I mean, I think the the people from the Newhall Ranch had given us the background on it. This this snake had been in there for for years. I mean, it's, yeah. it was a granddaddy. Um, <laughs> and they finally, during the tour duty show, because you know we, we went and used that same ranch later, uh, they finally got it out, and um, I think they put it up into the hills or something because they need to remove the wood pile for some reason. <laughs> so they, they, but they rescued, they rescued it out of there. I sure as hell wouldn't have wanted to win the person to try to get that snake. It was massive. The other thing was, uh, I'd have to send every time I found a place to shoot. Um, uh, and you know, we stayed pretty close to camp because the woods is the woods, right? Right. Yeah. It turned 90 degrees and it's a whole different place. Yeah. So I'd scout a little place. I, path or something or a little spot and then i'd send russ in to make sure there wasn't any poison oak <laughs> <laughs> all right there was poison oak everywhere it was all over the place Ooh. i think i actually did come down because i used to yes, when you i was did. a kid when i was a kid i used to get it awful and then i sort of got immune to it but but i got a little bit of it yeah i remember damn yeah you know oh my god i'm still allergic to it the sets uh we had a village and a base camp and that's because in the, that year, I was producing and writing Vietnam War stories. And uh, I got permission from them to use the sets when they were done, not take them down, which they usually would have done. And I wrote into the script a base camp and a Vietnamese village. <laughs> that's perfect. Which is great because I... Promise you, I did not get paid enough money for those two sets. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of money and how everything looked, when we were talking ahead of time, Jim Al and I, comments came up that the uniforms, the props, like everything is really point on. And Pat, you mentioned earlier about even when you were with HBO, they didn't want you to do all that. It's expensive. How difficult was it to get period accurate uniforms and equipment for your film? It was difficult. Uh, the tiger fatigues were hard to find, especially the right sizes and everything, and multiples. We needed multiples. The weapons weren't that hard. Though the, We went at one point, I went to D.C. and met with the Pentagon to try and get Army per permission, the cooperation to help us. And I sat down with a general, a little one. He was like five feet tall. Okay. And... And he said, this is all wrong, this script. Nobody carried these weapons in Vietnam. And I said, uh, well, I did. And here's the pictures. 
Oh my God. And he, he, he still, no, no, it's wrong. And nobody in the army cusses. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so he clearly had an agenda. <laughs> uh, and I said, uh, are you fucking kidding me? And, <laughs> and he was, oh my. He, he was, he was quite serious about it. Uh, and so we didn't get any kind of cooperation. Uh, the weapons were easy to find, a M60, the 16s, the Car 15. You know, they'd been used in um, uh, some of the TV shows. And uh, the Tiger Fatigues were hard to find, but we got those. And the wardrobe people were really good about getting them faded and everything. Mm. You know, the set worked because we stayed in so close there. And the village was perfect, except... <laughs> In the final scene, a helicopter comes in to pick up the survivors, and uh, Richard Brooks, the actor playing O.D., is in this hut, and he's got to dash out of it and run to the helicopter. And when the helicopter landed, it blew the hut over. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, my God. I remember that. Oh, it's hilarious. This is our hero hut, and... Yeah, and, and so we oh put it back the way it was supposed to be, and they bungee corded it to the ground. <laughs> yeah. And Richard's crouching in there, and I'm in there with him, and Alan's in there because he's got to follow him. Right. And there's a bungee cord in the way, but it's the only thing holding this thing up. <laughs> <laughs> and I took a knife. And as when I yelled action, I cut the bungee cord, <laughs> <laughs> and the thing started falling on us, and we all <laughs> ran out to the helicopter for the last shot, and we got it. Yeah, that was good. We got it in one. We had to, because we only after the helicopter didn't get off for a day, we had to do almost two days worth of helicopter shots, in one and a half days. Yeah, that's right. You know, this this was the only time in my entire career where I had to get into a costume. And the only time in my career where I actually had a dressing room. <laughs> I was actually kind of embarrassed by it. I said, "Oh my god, I, I've got my own dressing room." And I and one of the pic, one of the two pictures I found by the way is a picture of me in my in my uniform. Yeah. Well, we ha he had to be in uniform in case we saw his hands. We well, could, you did see my hands. Or his feet. Quite a few times. And his feet and so on. You know, his body. So he had to be in uniform. So he had to put fatigues on every day. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of cool. I loved it. I loved the fact that I had to get into into costume. <laughs> yeah. You know, Lynn Powell, who's uh, listed as your costume designer, I worked with her on West Wing. She went on to have quite oh, yeah. a career in the costume battle. Oh, all of our people were top notch. They were great. We had a great crew. Yeah, we did. They kicked ass for us. Didn't need them that often, but when you need them, you're desperate. Yeah. And they would come through every time. The biggest problem you have on these kind of shows, this is back when you'd use blanks in your weapons. Uh, today, they've got all sorts of electronic devices that fake right. you know, gunshots and everything. But we use blanks. Blanks dirty up a gun Ugh. beyond comprehension. And so they jam. And so we had, I requested, and it cost us money, to have two M60s, right, for the days we fired, because he would fire off half a belt and it would jam, and we'd have to replace it with another one. Uh, and so the prop guy and his assistant had to be cleaning these things all the time. You know, uh, it, it, uh, they, they were great. Yeah. I don't think we had any hiccups because of the crew. And the armors were superb. Oh, and our script supervisor. Script supervisor was this lady, this woman I'd used in uh, War Stories. She was great. Is Christina Alcorn her name? I see that on IMDb, but... Yeah. She uh, was a Southern Belle, <laughs> and she wore these big hats to keep the sun out of her <laughs> uh, skin and, and so on, and... Uh, she had to run in the jungle and, and keep tabs of everything. And quite often the script supervisor is sitting there by the monitor in a chair. But no, she had to get out there and, and run with us. Yeah, because there, no, there was no monitor. I mean, there was just... No. She just had to watch. She was on it every page. It was just great. And she went through rehearsal with us. Yeah. 
we rehearsed with the script supervisor. Yeah, she was very helpful. She was very helpful and made some great suggestions, even in our yeah. blocking of the scenes. She was yeah. helpful. No, she was just everybody. I was. I, I I'll take a, a suggestion from anybody. Yeah. You know, and and uh, everybody, people would come up with great lines every once in a while. They just, <laughs> you know, they were into it. Yeah, I, I think the the collective, the collective input. Especially, I mean, you always had an idea of how you want to start the blocking of a scene, but then it was yeah. that it be, they became evolved because when we had a camera there, and then there was an evolution to that, and yeah. and a lot of people contributed. The actors as well, of course, they they tend to do that anyway. But 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 I think quite a few people were really helpful, and there'd always be some suggestion from somebody. Yeah, my storyboards were mainly to find out what's important. Yes. I would, okay, this is the line I really need to get in a close-up. This is the movement I need to get here, or whatever. The storyboards were for me. I don't, I don't think I showed them to anybody. I think you showed me a couple of times, but you know what was really important, and I think what was so helpful is, is you always, whenever we'd start a new scene, you always started with what, what the kernel of the scene was about. Yeah. You always gave everybody... A good idea of what this scene was about. I, I think scripts are a series of big red dots. Each scene has a big red dot in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what it's about. You gotta find that dot. And there's text and there's subtext, and then you're hoping the actors or the cameraman or somebody brings in another piece, right? And so I had the text firmly in my head. I had the subtext pretty much figured out. And I was waiting for somebody else to come in and give me something else uh, extra. Right, right. And the, quite often they did. The actors, yep. uh, Alan, uh, one of the crew members. Somebody would see something. Yeah, one of the crew members, uh, I forget who it was, uh, came up to me and says, do uh, you see what uh, Nick is doing with his hands there? And I said, no, I didn't. That was it. You know, next time I shot, I we rehearsed, I watched his hands and I, and I nudged Alan and yeah, you give me one of the kicks of the nudges, and yeah. the hands and I go down to the hands. <laughs> yeah. No, Alan and I had a little communication, nonverbal. We did. I, if I want him to raise the camera, I touched uh, his shoulder. If I want him to lower it, hit, I think he hit my elbow or something like that. Yeah. And if I wanted to move in, I touched the top of his back. We had we had a whole signal thing. That's right. I forgot about that. We didn't use it much because Alan w was pretty spot on. But every once in a while, and uh, we learned a lot in that rehearsal week, uh, and it all fed into the shoot. The shoot was pretty. I don't think we did more than three takes. Uh, very rarely did we do more than three takes, if ever. And quite often, I'd keep the first take, and that'd be it. Yeah, it's generally the case anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it just you you know it when you see it, and there's something about the first take. Well, yeah, because it's the first take. Yeah, the actors are looser. Yeah, even if it's been rehearsed, it's unrehearsed because they know the cameras are rolling, so it's the first time. So there's a certain. But everybody steps up too. I always liked the first take. I mean, I I would often like in the years that I did steady cam. My my first take usually on Steadicam was always the best. So if there was a big, long, complicated Steadicam shot, I'd just walk myself through it. I'd never put the Steadicam on. And directors would always say, or the DPs would always say, why don't you, you know, look at it with say, no, no, I'd rather just walk it, feel it. Because my first take was always the best because it was instinctive. And I think that's true for this movie too, because... And and I could see if, when in, in rehearsal if the actors were getting too stale. Mm. And so I would shoot, start shooting a rehearsal and not tell them. <laughs> right. And we'd get tail marks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys were shooting that? <laughs> <laughs> you guys were shooting that? Oh. <laughs> Just trying to keep the spontaneity. It was hard. And after a while, Pat, I think we almost were doing it often where we'd just yeah. start. You'd nudge me and say, roll the camera, you know? <laughs> and yeah. Then... Because of what you guys are saying, and I'm enjoying the heck out of this. You got those five to seven guys, and they not just your film crew and, and the sound guy and everybody, you got these other guys, they're bunched together this whole um this whole movie. 
there's no break from each other. There's there's no one who's standing alone. Everybody has to be together in this, in in all these takes. And it's, I just I see it better now listening to what you're saying. But it's like that's a that's a really tight group of people to to be in there filming. Yeah, and, and you have to give props to the uh, actors. They were helping each other. They were really doing and uh, as an actor as a character was killed off they were taken away from the set immediately yeah and they weren't allowed to come back yeah and the other other actors felt that loss yeah even the crew felt it i know i felt it i felt it deeply when i didn't have an actor there yeah because we shot the whole thing in continuity i think yes didn't we? in sequence except for the helicopter stuff except for the helicopter but that was really important for us to do that the actors would help each other. You know, I, I, I'd see it, and it made me feel so good. I'd go and tell, uh, you know, Jason Tomlin, uh, Nick's having a problem here. Uh, you know, can you give him a, a an assist? And uh, he'd go over, and I don't know what they talked about, but the next take would be beautiful. That's related to nothing. The actor that played Nick is a Jeopardy champion. <laughs> it's serious. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> he's such a character anyway. He He's a nurse or a doctor's assistant? Yeah, now? he's a doctor's assistant now. Yeah. But he won quite a lot of money on Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah. That's really crazy. But, uh, yeah, the actors, uh, they they came up. They worked hard. It was rough on them at times. It was rough on Alan. Alan Kasold uh, went into the hospital after we finished shooting. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, from exhaustion. It was exhaustion. That's all it was, yeah. Well, you can imagine we shot all daylight hours. We get out there. We, we shot 10 hours, maybe. Yeah. And there's no setup. Usually on a film, you shoot the scene, and then the crew comes in and strikes the set or moves it and so on. And there's an hour, hour and a half, sometimes longer between setups. We'd finish the scene, I'd go find a new piece of woods and we'd start all over again. Yeah. And we rehearsed with the camera. So it's never off his shoulder. So for 10 hours. For three weeks. <laughs> for three weeks. Six days a week. <laughs> Alan Kasel had this camera on his shoulder. Needless to say, I was in great shape by the end of the movie. <laughs> Except for exhaustion. <laughs> yeah. And there's no uh, cameraman around that take it off, uh, give him a break. No. No dolly, no crane, nothing. Just on his shoulder every day. So my first thing in the morning after I went to see how the actors were doing, I go and see how Alan was doing. <laughs> yeah. But he was up to it. He was there. Yeah. The, the, the other thing, too, is I, I had to constantly, you know, I was still like in Mr. Operator mode, you know, and and I kept on having to remind myself, no, you're also the DP. Make sure you get the exposure right. Make sure you're taking care of that stuff. Yeah. So after a while, I just I carried my little spot meter like it was a it was like like it was like <laughs> oh, my, that's right. It was like it was like a 45 on my hip. You know, I had a little <laughs> holster for it and I'd pull it out. And I and that's I literally did everything with that little spot meter, that and bead boards. Everybody would be, I'd have the grips going around with little bead boards just to get, bounce some light on everybody's face. That's how I lit the whole thing. Yeah. That we use, we bounce boards. Uh, I don't think we used the light once. I think we, for the night we used scenes. lights for the night scenes. Yeah. And I had yeah. Rick, Richard Sands come in, who was a gaffer I had known very well. And he came in and helped me light the night scene. Yeah. I didn't want that. Uh, a lot of night scenes just way over lit. Yeah. No, we, we did it very sparingly. Made it look like moonlight. Yeah. That's the only light we use. We use the bounce boards a lot. It's all natural. Yeah. And and it, it was very difficult because you have a black actor and a white actor. You can't light them separately. We don't have that facility. No. Nope. Yeah. Alan did a great job there. You know, we sprayed the woods to make it look green because yeah. <laughs> the foliage was dying and we dammed up the stream to make that swamp the swamp scene tickled the hell out of me it was very hard for me not to laugh uh because they're struggling through this mud right yeah and richard got stuck uh richard playing od and then nick got stuck 
And I had to yell cut because nobody could get out of the mud. <laughs> yeah. And no, I think I got stuck behind all three yeah. of them. <laughs> And I think I, I think I used, I think I said, "Hey, I'm stuck." And I think you, 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 I think you put that in later. If you had the actor say it. Yeah. Uh, but it's so funny because we had met before doing this podcast just to say hi and hey, what you've been doing. And it was funny because when Patrick was talking about spraying the trees, it brought back memories of a movie I did twelve years before that called Roar where I was working with all these big cats and stuff, and it was just up across the valley in uh, Soledad Canyon. And, you know, we worked on the thing for four years because you keep on, you know, the cats never did what you want them to do. They're like house cats, only they're big, giant cats. And, you know, we'd, we'd spend, we'd finally get into December, and we'd lose all the leaves and spraying the trees and stuff, and we'd have to finally quit. And then next spring, you'd start all over again. But I remember when spraying the trees... Spraying the trees for Charlie Mopick, I started getting PTSD on the <laughs> war film because, and up really up until about seven or eight years ago, I still have dreams, nightmares about the big cats, and so it's really traumatic. And so when he brought that up, I said, "Oh, that God, that's right." And all during Charlie Mopick, when we were filming, I had the craziest nightmares about those damn cats. <laughs> so I wasn't getting a lot of great sleep after working 10 out 12 hours you know, hauling a camera around <laughs> crazy stuff I, I want to know what camera they actually shot the film with and was there a prop camera that was different from that we didn't really ever see the camera I think in the movie that well but it was an eclair super 16 okay an eclair super 16 and we shot on Fuji film. Yes, we did. Shot on Fujifilm. And there was a bit of a problem. Uh, we had to have the eclair slightly adjusted because Fujifilm is slightly thicker than Kodak. And I was worried about dust uh, from the uh, emulsion side building up and possibly scratching. So we had, I forget what the rental place we got it from, but they took like a, a mil couple of millimeters more, less tension on the, on the film gate so it didn't press down quite so hard. Oh, yeah. okay because of that reason. And also the other thing about the, for, for doing that much extended hand holding, the Eclair was better than the, um, than the Aerie 16 SR, which had just come out, was fairly new. We were using the SR on tour duty and which was, which is a, a better camera for hand holding ergonomically for short things. It was just felt better, but for a long take, the Eclair was, was a better camera. One of the problems was some of the takes were like eight minutes long, uh, longer, and uh, we would have to see how much film we had to make sure it didn't run out in the middle of the scene. Right. <laughs> That's right. One of the things that was very helpful in terms of timing of this thing was the Sundance experience because we had these long, we had these monologues where the character would talk, and there was one it came out to be 11 minutes long and Patrick rewrote that scene in order to make it a little bit shorter. Yeah. You know what? Now that I'm thinking, I, I can't remember if it was an Eclair or an Aton camera. <laughs> I think it was an Aton. I think it was an Aton to be honest with you. Yeah. yeah. Does that change everything or can I just drop Aton in instead of Eclair just, on the things you said? Before? Just drop, <laughs> just drop Aton in there. I'm pretty sure it was an Aton. <laughs> Time and time and time it goes by. <laughs> a lot of water under the bridge. No, I'm pretty sure it was at Aton. By the way, did I mention where the names came from? And No, please fill us in on that, Pat. Oh, yes, please. Uh, Norse mythology. Oh. OD is Odin. Pretty boy is Baldur the Beautiful and so on. You're always stuck for names and you get sued sometimes. I was sued for, by a guy named Holland for Mr. Holland's opus. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> How far did that get? <laughs> Nowhere, because it was called Mr. Herrick's opus until Stephen Herrick came on as director. Uh, <laughs> and, and I used Holland because I lived in Holland, Michigan. And uh, yeah. remember your old computers? If you changed a word, it had to have the same number of letters. Yeah, I do remember. Otherwise, that. it would go over or it'd leave a space. 
Right. Right. All the way down. It would, yeah, it would and, trickle and, down. Yeah, yeah. And Herrick, H E R R I C K, had the same number of letters as Holland. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it became Mr. Holland's opus. <laughs> Perfect. But uh, so names, I just, you know, use the Norse mythology. That's great. That was great. Was Ordinary Bob based on a tribute? to a helicopter pilot or was that just uh ordinary bob is what we called robert redford <laughs> oh that's <laughs> hilarious <laughs> so so it's an easter egg so, so yeah. to speak. <laughs> uh, he did a film called ordinary people and he tries to, very hard to be a regular guy up at sundance but uh, he found it difficult like because he was in editing in LA when I was there. And one day uh, he was there and we invited him to a picnic. We got some watermelons and so on. We were going to have a picnic on a weekend. And Bob says, uh, well, can I come? And we said, yeah, of course. Yeah, come on along. So we're all getting ready for the picnic and everything. And Bob doesn't show up. He's usually late. Nobody's worried about that. And then all of a sudden, a helicopter comes over the mountain oh, God. <laughs> and lands by the ski slope. And Bob gets off the helicopter carrying a paper bag full of goodies <laughs> and joined the picnic. <laughs> Classic. And then when he was done, he got back in the helicopter and flew back to, to the airport and back to L.A. <laughs> it's hilarious. Well, th thanks for that knowledge. <laughs> yeah, ordinary Bob. Yeah, he was he was great though. He made some phone calls for us, right, Michael? Yeah, he did. Trying to get it set up. He made a lot of phone calls. Yeah, he's the one who called Columbia, called Putnam, and said you should do this film. And so yeah, he on. called. He did. I mean, I had a, my own relationship with Putnam through my agent, but um, yeah. but yes, Redford worked behind the scenes and ultimately the majority of the money came from rca columbia which was their home video division oh okay but uh sundance and, and i don't think we would have made the film without sundance and Robert. Oh, without there's no doubt about it i mean sundance made this possible sounds like it. i just want to tell all of y'all that worked on that movie what a wonderful job you did it is one of my all-time favorite movies and it's one of the few movies where I where people don't I try to explain what I did in my Air Force career and uh, they don't really get it until they watch the movie. Then they say, OK, I get it. It's the closest thing that I can use to explain to them something close to what I did, except I was never shot at. OK, so <laughs> shelled once in Balad, but I don't really count that. Those guys go through that <laughs> like four or five times a day. I was just flying through and caught it once. But anyway, um, I just wanted to thank you. I think it was very important work uh, that you did, Pat, the, the way that you developed the film and your site to do it with what they call found footage style, I think was just perfect, especially for a combat cameraman. This is way before Blair Witch sort of made that style of shooting popular. Yeah. I think they copied y'all because Blair Witch came after y'all. <laughs> yeah. Way after us. I, I know that I heard I, I, it was a really incredible compliment to this film i heard years later I, I was talking to this guy who was had operated on some movie that jim cameron was directing and of course jim cameron's known for being kind of brutal on the set and this guy he was a camera operator and he was doing all this handheld stuff and jim cameron finally just said cut 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 god damn it and he walked over to this guy and said do you know how to handhold a camera god damn it this is the worst handheld stuff I've ever seen. You want to see a great film? You want to see a film that really will teach you how to do handheld? Watch 84 Charlie Mopic. And he told me about this years later. Hoorah! About Jim Cameron <laughs> referring to our film. <laughs> it's still my, of all the movies I made, it's still my favorite movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. So I said, did you watch the movie? He said, yeah, I did. And boy, said, that was good handheld stuff. It was a great way of telling the story. He said, that story couldn't have been told any other way, like we all know. I mean, it's just the way to tell it. I just really liked the fact that it wasn't, you know, hoorah movie. It was realistic. It was about 
how painful that is to put people in a situation like that, especially young kids and send them off to war to go kill other people that are young. And you made it look tasteless. And you made it look bad. There's a, a, an old adage that uh, I heard before I made this film, that you can't make an anti-war movie. That the very visceral impact of the action makes young men want to do that. Mm. And uh, I was I was trying very hard to show how ugly it is, how tedious it is, without, well, see, you can't make a film about boredom because you'd bore the audience. But being a soldier out on patrol, it's tedious and boring until somebody shoots you, at you. And so uh, I wanted to make an anti-war film. I, I, I don't know if it worked or not. The other thing I really loved about what Patrick did in the writing of this and the characters that he brought is that it also talks about the economics of the soldier that comes in to have to b become a soldier. For a lot of Americans and for a lot of kids everywhere in the world who join their militaries, they do it because it's, it, it's a chance. It's, a, it's an economic advantage. It, it, if they can survive whatever the rigors are, they they get an education they all that stuff so so this is about this is about those other kids who who had to had didn't have, really have a lot of choices that wanted to better themselves that weren't pro or against the war they were just this is this is a place where they had to be in order to to make themselves better and so and i think that really comes across in this film better than probably 99% of the war movies you ever see that that was me I went to, in the Army because I wanted to go to college. I wanted the GI Bill. I'm, I'm the oldest of 13, you know, factory workers, migrant workers. I've worked since the day I was eight years old. And I went in the Army because I wanted a better life. And I thought the GI Bill was the way to get, to, and it worked. Yeah, my dad went through that. Yeah, it worked. Uh, I bettered myself. Uh, my situation. And I grew up. I grew up. I mean, you know, the trouble is you go on the military, you're 18, 19, you think you're bulletproof. Yeah. You you haven't been out in the world. I, I'm, I'm all for reinstating the draft. I think that um, we live in a world where people are in their little bubbles now. Mm -hmm. And they don't, you, you get in the army, the Navy, Air Force, whatever, you learn the asshole uh, factor that, you know, and the idiot factor. Every job you're going to have, there's going to be an asshole and an idiot. And sometimes <laughs> that person's your boss, yeah. you know, and you're going to meet people from different races and different social economics uh, places, and you have to get along with them. You have to become a team. You have to perform work together. And I think that's good. And I think we should have a thing where, I don't care if it's a civil service going out and fighting fires or going into the military. Doing service is what you're saying. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you grow up. <laughs> I had flashbacks when I was in the Philippines. I was in the Philippines for six years with a combat camera unit. I just love being out in the bush. And it was hard, though. There's times you wanted to pass out. You got your legs stuck in mud. You lose your boots, you know. I was trying to get that across, that you have the mosquitoes eating you. You have the leeches eating you. You're hot. You're carrying 100 pounds. You're tired. And there's somebody out there trying to kill you. So you have to pay attention. <laughs> And you Boy. can barely put one foot in front of the other. That was what the lieutenant was for. You know, the, so how hard this was. I lived in the Philippines, 69 uh, to 72 at Subic Bay, uh, naval base there. When, when you brought up AFRTS, they, they had the radio going and that lifeline to uh, U.S. radio. And uh, so talking about getting on Mars radio and talking to people back home. <laughs> those were all real things. And uh, yeah. so I, I, that was just a personal thing. I kind of enjoyed that. That took me back home a little bit. And I wanted to make a comment that I noticed 
all during the movie, they were cleaning their weapons. There were constantly somebody cleaning weapons. And uh, having lived in the jungle around the jungle, yeah, that's a that's a yeah. big deal. Yeah. Now Michael Nolan didn't go in the military. Uh, he was a peace protester. I was when I came back. And a lot of the guys who didn't serve used to go up to me and say, I wish I'd served. And I, I say, I wish you didn't. Well, I'm glad I didn't. Yeah, it was, a, it was an ugly, ugly, nasty war. And war, you know, and, and the, the first thing you learn is that it's not the s- soldiers who suffer the most. It's the civilians around. Yeah. I, I just, I, I wanted to make a film that said, okay, killing people is not fun, <laughs> which a lot of movies do. Uh, and being a soldier isn't all glory, but it's a job that people do to take care of the guy next to him. Right. That was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, we, uh, we learned that uh, every day on the set. It was a great experience, I'll tell you that. It was a great way for me to kick off my, my career, my, my second career. So. <laughs> my favorite story is when the movie was over, we assembled everybody because Patrick wanted to thank everybody. And I didn't know Patrick, uh, even though we had worked, I didn't know him that well. I mean, I just saw him as this tough sort of military vet. And we got all the people and Patrick broke down. He just, he was so moved that he couldn't thank him. And that is the favorite moment of my whole career. Yeah. I remember that moment. Yeah. Well, it was, it was pretty emotional. Uh, the five, six years it took to get there. And then all these people helping you with something that you'd put imagined, right? And and they all worked so damn hard. And they did such a great job. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it was over. I had one other thing I wanted to fit in before you wrap this up. I want everybody to know that Skid was our FNG. <laughs> Kidding, really? Yes, that's correct. It's hilarious. <laughs> and Jim was my boss at Vandenberg, and then Skid oh. was our boss. Oh, gosh. That's He's hilarious. done good, though. We're proud of him. Um, also glad no one was ever shooting at us. But uh, yeah. yeah, those are some good years. One last note for me, as I also mentioned on the show before, my father was a veteran of the Vietnam War whose distinguished Army career lasted 30 years. He passed in 2020 and his birthday was Veterans Day. So so I think about him a lot uh, this time of year. He also really loved the movies and I bet he would have really enjoyed this conversation. On that note, we'll call it a wrap. I can't thank you guys enough for being on the show today. It was an honor. That's good, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Y'all made my day. <laughs> Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info at our website, below the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. You'll also find past episodes and links to all our social media, so check it out. Closing credits, thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and to all of our listeners, I appreciate you. The Below the Line logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. No one has bought a mug in a while, so I'm going to repeat that. The Iwo Jima-inspired logo, which should appeal to military and film aficionados alike, is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. After you've bought a mug or a sticker or a t-shirt, please rate us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line.